Hey, t- today we're going to wrap up with Exodus chapter 35. This is the end of my series on the book of Exodus. And um, we're going to pick up at verse 4. This is Exodus 35, starting at verse 4. And really an exciting passage to close out on. Um, and then next week start on immeasurably more. But um, this is exciting because to me this is a high point in Israel's history. They've been set free. They're going to put together a tabernacle. You'll see that in a moment. And what, well, you know what, let's just read it because it just, I'm speechless. Exodus 35 verse 4. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, from what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen, goat hair, ramskins dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. All who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle with his tent and his covering, clasps, Frames, crossbars, posts, bases, the ark with its poles and the atonement cover, and the curtain that shields it. The table with its poles and all its articles, and the bread of the presence. The lampstand that is for light with its accessories, lamps and oil for the light. The altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense. The curtain for the doorway at the entrance to the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils. The bronze basin with its stand. The curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard. The tent pegs for the tabernacle and for the courtyard and their ropes. The woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary. Both the sacred garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests. And then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service, for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ramskins dyed red, or hides of sea cows brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord, and everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen. And all the women who were willing and had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil, for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. And now I want us to go over to Exodus 36 and just look at two verses here, verse 6 and 7. Exodus 36, verse 6 and 7. They have to be considered as every church treasure's dream verse. Okay, look at this. It says, Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they had already had, what they already had, was more than enough to do all the work. Can you imagine that? He says, No more offerings. That might even be good news for some of you guys, not just church treasure. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. And I pray, Lord, that we would glean everything that you have for us. Lord, that, we would, that we'd hear from your Holy Spirit through your word this morning. God, just speak to us and help us to put it into practice, to find application, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, imagine this. Amen. In Jesus' name. Here's an assembly. Here's the work of God, and there's no need. There's no need. Everything that was needed was supplied. (laughs) You know, this is a pastor's dream. This is a church treasurer's dream. Can you imagine no need? As we read here in chapter 35, and this was not as though it were manna floating down from heaven. 
Do you understand that? This is not some supernatural supply from God, but rather what is so exciting to me here, and I love miracles of God, and I expect miracles. I mean, I, you know, I do. I expect healings and miracles. That's the kind of God that we serve. But what really excites me is that what we see here is a need that is being met by tangible and earthly resources of people. That excites me. It's not hard for God to, you know, and it's done. I think what is so much harder is for God to move the human heart to respond. Amen? Amen. The hardness of man's heart. How many times do we read that in the Old Testament? How many times do we see that in the book of Exodus? And I want you to notice here too that no one, we don't read of anything here that, that alludes to the fact, we don't see that anyone had to pray about this. No one seemed to pray that it would happen. They simply gave out of their excess. That's all, that's all they did. It almost reminds me of, of what a preacher once told his congregation concerning a, a shortfall in their church budget. There was a certain need. He addressed his flock and he told them, he said, folks, I got some good news and some bad news about our finances. The bad news is that we've got some bills to pay and we need some money. That's the bad news. But the good news is that we've already got the money. The problem is it's still out there. And that was the situation here in these, in these chapters. Everything that was needed was already there. This, 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 this wasn't, again, a gift from heaven. It wasn't plunder from the, from the Egyptians. It was already there. It just needed to be reallocated. It needed to be released by those who had it to give. Now, I have, no, I have absolutely no idea of the national wealth of Israel at that time, but let me suggest to you that I believe that our nation is doing much better than those Old Testament Hebrews. I really do. I believe that we're, our, nation, our church is doing better. And in spite of what we might hear in the news today, our nation is just doing a whole lot better. We're doing pretty well. And most of us are doing pretty well. And God has really blessed us. And I believe that it's because, I believe it's because in this church, we practice the blessed life. And you know what the blessed life is? The blessed life is a life that gives. It's a life that gives. The blessed life is a life that allows the abundance of God to flow through them. That's how it's designed in God's word. Listen to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. It says, one man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, without reason, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Again, one man gives freely. In fact, one version, I think it's King James, says one man scatters, and yet he gains more. Now, folks, that doesn't make sense to the natural mind. And then the second part of that first verse, verse 24, another withholds without reason. Another one is miserly, calculating, and yet comes to poverty. Do you see, do you see the contrast? What we're being told here is a, is a principle throughout the scriptures. Jesus amplified it in the New Testament. If you give, it will be given. Press down, shaken together, yet overflowing in your lap so you won't be able to contain it. That's God's word. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And listen to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Paul said, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich. Look at this verse, verse 11. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You see, God does not at all mind making us rich. I I don't think he has a problem with that. Not at all. 
And again, 2 Corinthians 9, 11, He will make us rich, it says, but for a purpose. And the purpose is not to hoard. The man who hoards come to po comes to poverty. The one who gives out freely gains even more. God will make us rich, according to 2 Corinthians 9.11, He'll make us rich for the distinct purpose of us being generous so that our generosity will cause others to thank God, give thanksgiving to God, and glorify Him. Amen? Does that make sense? And notice, He will pour as much into you as you're willing to allow to flow through you. And I'll tell you what, I wish, I wish, you know, if you just looked at some of the testimonies, some of the wealthiest people, I think of David and Barbara Green. And had, had the, I've had the privilege of meeting them. Hobby Lobby, you know, the Hobby Lobby? They, they, I mean, I, I can't, I forget what their, their business grosses in a year. It's in the bill, billions. It's in the billions. All their profit goes to ministry. They, they don't want to be rich, personally rich. They've designed their corporation so that when, when, when it all closes, if it ever goes away and it all goes away, it's, they're done. No, no one family member will inherit anything out of that company. They've designed it that way. They just changed it in the last few years. They shared that with us. Incredible. Incredible. Whereas, you know, in the business world, you build up a big, a big business and you've got a profit, you sell it off and you enjoy the profits. Their company is not designed that way. When it ceases to exist, it exists only, only to create money for ministry. That's incredible. That's unheard of. And yet, you know what? It, all, it sounds biblical. It sounds biblical. But the reason that God would pour money into your life, wealth into your life, is so that you could allow it to flow through, that you be generous towards others, so that they would glorify God. God wants to be glorified. You know that? And you know, the truth is, and this blesses me as your pastor, most of you practice this in your own life. I know that. You, I know you do. I can see it in your life. And you know what? We practice it corporately here as a church. We as a church have been giving more than $400,000 a year to missions in the last several years. We've been well up over the $400,000 mark. We're assisting works all over the world. $10,000 will be given to Fire Bible this year again. We're going to be giving $50,000 at the end of this year to help with the Bible college that's being built in Myanmar. We've given $30,000 so far. Excuse me, that number just went up. We gave $10,000, you, we, all of us, gave $10,000 a few weeks ago to those that got hit by Hurricane Irma. So we've now given $40,000 this year to Convoy of Hope. Assisting, we've, we've been assisting in church planting across the nation. We have come alongside two home missions churches, one in Wilmington, one in Dover. We have our daughter church in Middletown. And in spite of all the funds that we've given away, as a result of all the funds we've given away, you know what? God has blessed us. And by the way, let me show you an updated photo of the project in Myanmar. The men's dorm is now one month away from being finished. And I'll tell you what, I walked through the old dorm and it was, it was a bunch of teak boards, you know, just teak boards and cracks in between them all over the place. I mean, thatch roof, it was a couple stories tall. 300 men living in the space. It really probably should have held about 50. This dorm will hold 300 men. Incredible. Three stories, and they built it so they can even go up two more stories. It's got that much of a footing. We've done that, guys. We did that. We did that. That entire building was a quarter million dollars. That's it. In America, that would be $5 million probably. Incredible. We're doing it. And for those of you who are new to Praise Assembly, I want you to know that, you know, in spite of all the projects we've done over the years, 11 years ago, we added on an addition with a cafe and, and a chapel and a couple classrooms and 8,000 plus square feet. We added that space. We went into debt $600,000. Got into the property, got into that addition. Never missed a missions payment. We didn't decrease our giving. We didn't have to cut our budget for Royal Rangers or Girls Men. Nothing changed. And in spite of keeping everything the same and giving tons of money towards missions, we paid off that loan in three years, less than three years. I, you know, that's, that's the blessed life. Amen. 
see, our generosity remain constant. And I know pastors and I know churches, they'll go into something like that. Oh, we gotta, we gotta, cut, we gotta cut the missions budget. We gotta 400, we gotta cut it down to 100,000. We can't give that much. We gotta, you know, once we, once we get in better shape, we'll get back. That's not how it works, guys. That's not how it works. To the rational, logical mind, yes. But it doesn't work that way in God's kingdom. The carnal mind in, in our own human understanding, it, it, it would have made more sense to take care of your own needs. And we didn't do that. We didn't focus on the debt, but we got out from under it. If we give generously, we reap generously. If we're generous people, we ourselves will be refreshed. Proverbs 11, verse 24 and 25. Praise God for his faithfulness to his word. He is faithful. Now, I want you to know my heart this morning. You know, looking back at this 35th chapter of Exodus, and, and just thinking about how I've chosen to lead in the pastoral ministry. Um, yeah, next, next September, it'll be 40 years for me in ministry. 20 years, I, I love the fact, same year, 20, I won't forget this way. It'll be Kathy and I, it'll be our 20th anniversary, excuse me, 40th anniversary. <laughs> I had it mixed up. 40th anniversary almost 40 years in ministry, it'd be 39 years, and 20 years here as your pastor. I was going to say, 20th anniversary. <laughs> Kathy and I have been married 20 years. It just seems so quick. 40 years, it seems like 20 years, honey. <laughs> I got to get that right, right? 40 years married, 20 years here. <laughs> We need to turn those lights off. They're hot. <laughs> They're hot. Oh, boy. But, you know, after all that time, I, seriously, I, I so desperately wish that all churches, all churches, I don't care what brand, that every church in our nation would have a testimony like ours. The testimony like this that we read in, in Exodus, the testimony of the generosity of the Hebrews is powerful. And our church's testimony is powerful. You are generous people, and I am extremely proud to be your pastor. And you know, for comparison's sake, let me tell you that we give to missions, at least, we give to missions as much as churches at least double our size, and in reality, 10 times our size. We give as much, you, you know, you, you know, in other words, churches of 4,000 are not giving the money we're giving. And that's really sad. And so again, I want to commend you for your faithful giving. And you know, really thinking about this, there are two errors that befall some churches. And the first is when it, the people in the church overlook the obvious. In other words, I know, I know, I've known Christians who will over-spiritualize a situation. Maybe you do too. And, and they'll, they'll over-spiritualize because it gives them the, the opportunity to sidestep their personal responsibility. And I'll show you this in a minute. They will suddenly turn all mystical so they can avoid the practical. And everybody knows that the spiritual person, you know, the one who over, they're, they're, they're just more, they're closer to God than the person who's practical. Right. And, and this is what happens. And I've seen this. They, there are people who will pray, they'll pray for financial needs to be met but at the same time, conveniently overlook any possibility that they might actually be part of the provision that's needed. You get it? They will pray for everyone else's heart to be touched. I mean, they'll pray high decibel. They'll mix in a little bit of tongues. They'll be really spiritual, praying for other people to be touched, for other people to be motivated to give, and yet they seem to be able to sidestep the unction of the Holy Spirit. Because they won't give anything. Well, I'm, I'm just praying. I'm really praying that God will move people. And there's probably not a verse more convicting than 1 John 3, 17. Listen to this one. It says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? No, don't just talk the walk. You need to walk the talk. You need to live it out. And realize that there's nothing about prayer mentioned here in Exodus 
35. Nowhere do we see anybody praying there. Doesn't mean they weren't. But Moses says we need all this stuff. And the people brought all this stuff to the point where he says, please don't bring anything more. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I, you know, have you ever seen the Goodwill and the Salvation Army boxes around town? Right? Usually they're full and then there's stuff piled up alongside of it. I, I just, I imagine this. I imagine, you know, there's the, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, and there's all these black plastic bags full of stuff for God to use. I mean, it's just, you know, somebody needs to empty that, that receptacle, okay? And Moses actually has to tell them to stop giving. Stop giving. Another good verse is James 1.27. It says, religion, the religion that God our Father accepts as pure and flawless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And it was caring for others. God loves that kind of religion. You see, it can be so easy, it can be convenient even to bypass the obvious. And not just with finances, but even with talents. If you notice, God said, I want you to bring your gold, you know, I want you to bring your gold, I want you to bring your silver, your bronze, I want you to bring acacia wood. And then what did he say? He said, then I need, I need the women who can spin that yarn. I need, the, I need the handymen who can construct the posts. And I need talent. I need people. Let's go back to Exodus for a moment. And we're going to read a few verses that we didn't read. This is Exodus 35, verse 30. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he's filled him with the Spirit of God, Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of, of crafts. You know, I pastored a church once, and we had, we had uh, deacons and, and trustees. And somehow they had understood that to mean that deacons do the spiritual stuff and the trustees do the other stuff. But did you realize that even in the book of Acts in the sixth chapter when the first deacons are chosen, do you realize that they first, when they needed, they needed men to wait on tables, it says? They needed men to distribute food to those in need. They already had apostles. They had men who could function the position of elder, if you would, but they, they, needed, they needed people to basically work the soup kitchen and feed the widows. First, first requirement, you know what the first requirement was in Acts chapter 6? That they would be full of the Holy Spirit. That they would be spiritual men. But it's just a mundane job. No, it's a spiritual job. And I love the fact that here, we're in the Old Testament, and it talks about this man, that he was filled with the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God gave him skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. It isn't either or. We need it all. In verse 32, he was to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, to engage in all kinds of artistic craftsmanship. And he's given both him and Aholiab, son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. So not only could he do it, but he could teach it. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as craftsmen, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, scarlet yarn, fine linen, weavers, all of the master craftsmen and designers. And so Bezalel, Aholiab, and other skilled persons to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. You see, Moses needed more than just gold or raw material. Amen? He needed God-given talent to accomplish the construction of the tabernacle. And again, I'm amazed how some people will not ever lift, some people will not lift a finger to help. They'll pray for the need to get met, but they themselves will not, they won't allow themselves to be considered. And so I want to give you some, some direction in this right now. Each time that you enter the doors of this church, if you see a need, fill it. If you see a need, fill it. If you see a problem, fix it. Don't just walk by it and pray about it. Amen? Okay, that was better than I was expecting. Don't ask God to do what you are fully capable of doing. Don't ask God to do what you can very easily do. Instead, use your petitions to ask God for the impossible. Until you come up with a cure for cancer, you pray for someone that has cancer. See? But don't, don't pray about having someone pick up a piece of trash out in the parking lot on your way in on Sunday morning. Just do it. 
get God involved in the things where there is no hope, where there's no answer, no easy cure, no solution. Amen. Now, second error I've seen in churches is, is in pastoral leadership that ne never challenges the people. Never challenges the people of God. And what I mean by this is I believe that it is a task of every pastor to encourage your sheep to come to higher ground. As I'd mentioned just a couple weeks ago, we are to provoke one another, right? Out of Hebrews chapter 11, we are to provoke one another, to spur one another, to irritate one another unto love and good works. <laughs> That was great. That was great. And, and, and I've seen pastors who regularly shy away from putting any kind of demands on their churches. And I believe that when pastors are reluctant or they're afraid to challenge their people, they're failing at their calling. That's what I'm supposed to do. They're failing the people whom they're supposed to be leading. Because see, when it comes to the three primary areas of stewardship, time, tithe, and talent, if a pastor doesn't challenge his congregation to stretch themselves, he's going to hinder them from receiving a God-given blessing. Really. Again, it's about the blessed life. When you give out, it comes back. And I believe that God blesses us when we act with generosity. I believe he, he blesses us when we act in obedience. I also believe that God blesses us when we step out in faith and do something. When we go out beyond our comfort zone. It's as simple as Luke 6.38. And I quoted before, give and it shall be given. And giving here, Exodus, has nothing, it's not limited to just finance. Three primary areas of stewardship, time, tithe, and talent. And part of my job as your pastor is to provide opportunity for you to give, to, for you to give the tithe, to share of your, to invest in, 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 in other people by serving them in ministry. That's your, that's your time and your, and your talent, utilizing your gifts for the sake of the kingdom. And it seems as though somehow I've always known this. Every, you know, first days of pastoral ministry, I've always known this. I've always encouraged people to go beyond what they thought they could do. But there was one moment that just made this indelible in my life. And when I was pastoring in New Jersey, I was also the stewardship director for the New Jersey district. And every other weekend, I would be in someone else's church preaching and teaching on stewardship. I'd be doing seminars on finance. And the weekend would begin on Friday night with a general session. And then I'd meet with people for appointments on Saturday. I'll never forget this one church in particular I went to. It was a terrible rundown mess. I mean, it was, I, I just couldn't believe that it was one of our Assembly of God churches. It was so beat up. The exterior of the church building had clapboards, wooden clapboards, that were cupping and curling and popping off the building. The sanctuary floor, when I walked in, was buckled. The carpet was matted. It was so greasy, I actually could slide my foot across the carpet. I challenge you to try it. No, don't try here because you'll get hurt. And the poor pastor. I mean, you could see the discouragement on his face. You could see his bewilderment. He had absolutely no idea about how, what to do about this building. He had no idea how to raise the funds to fix up something in this building. And, and so during that weekend... I had my individual interviews on Saturday and this little old Italian lady came in to see me about estate planning. And she, had, she, she was wearing a plain old, slightly soiled house dress. I mean, she, she looked like she had nothing to her name. I, I, I was actually surprised that she'd even come for an appointment. Because I figured, you know, estate planning, $10, uh, we're done in about two seconds. There isn't much I can do for you. I have to tell you, I was a little prejudiced. And that I thought this would be just a very simple appointment with nothing to work with. And in fact, I imagine, I imagine the church probably gave this woman a Thanksgiving basket every year. She really looked that dowdy. And as she spoke, and we began to take inventory of her estate, she revealed to me that she had $5 million in bank CDs. And that she needed help with her estate. <laughs> Now, as district stewardship director, I am bound to confidentiality, but I, I got to tell you, I so very much wanted to tell this pastor that I had found the answer to his problem. <laughs> I so very much wanted him to know that he had all the resources that he needed sitting right in those pews every weekend. And I, and I know that this woman, she would have been thrilled to help. 
She really was. She was very kind-spirited. You could tell that if someone had asked her for help, she'd be there for them. Or maybe even do it all. And by the way, not only was this church run down and beat up and neglected, but this church had no testimony, had no missions program, no outreach. It was an eyesore in the community. I mean, no one would want to be part of something so dilapidated. And all because the pastor was afraid to challenge the people. I don't mean manipulate. I don't mean use gimmicks. All he had to do is say, folks, we need new carpet. Let's take a special offering. And this woman would have done something. In fact, I calculated my mind that day. And this is back, this is a, 20, somewhere between 20 and 40 years. <laughs> Interest rates were higher. I calculated, just this, just this woman's money just sitting there. She, if she, she could have given $500,000 Right away, just based on one year's interest. She wouldn't even have touched her principal. And what does the Bible tell us in James 4, 2? You have not because you ask not. Now that's talking about asking God. But you see, the solution to the financial need of that church was right there in that church. Amen? Just like it was in Exodus. It was all right there. And I just thank God that I learned that truth a long time ago. This, this one incident solidified it in my life. I, yeah, everything is right here. And I thank God that I've never held back from challenging people. I've never, you know, that's why we are who we are as a church. And yet, please understand, this isn't about money. It's not about finance. I'm not taking, well, maybe we can have a special offering. Hopefully you're in the mood by now. But I thank God that I've always pastored missions-minded churches, missions-giving churches. Even the very first church that I pastored was one that Kathy and I started. We had one woman. After a year, we had about 17 people. And we began supporting our first missionary. On our first anniversary as a church, we began supporting our first missionary at $90 a month in 1980, 38 years ago. The last church I, I pastored prior to coming here, was ranked 38th in the nation out of 11,000 churches in per capita giving. 38th in the nation out of 11,000 churches. Not a large congregation, only about 150 or so. We gave 60% of our budget to missions. And now here at Praise, we've been among the top 100 churches in, in the nation in total missions giving for a long time. Out of 13,000 churches, last year we came in 70th. We've got churches that are 10,000, 20,000 in number. And we're giving more than they. And I think that says something about who we are. It really does. That, that demonstrates that we are a generous church. People. We're faith-filled people that we believe that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. And because he gave for us, we in turn imitate him and we give for the sake of others. Jesus said, freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely, give. You know, let's always be like these Hebrews in Exodus. Let's always feel the freedom to express our faith through giving. Because, you know, the truth is that people give to whom or to what they love. Really. And so as I close this morning, let's look at our hearts. And let's, let's, let's decide who we belong to. Let's determine who we belong to. Does our heart really belong to Jesus? Really? You know, wherever, wherever our treasure is, that's where our heart will be also. If our heart belongs to him, then our treasure belongs to him. Do we serve him? Do we give to him? Do we labor for him? Are we grateful for all that he's ever done for us? Keeping in mind, of course, that Jesus himself told us that whatever we do for the least of these, we do for him. Do we really love him? Do we demonstrate that love? I want to close by reminding you of the words of the Apostle Paul. And again, this is by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He said this in Romans 12.1. He said, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The most spiritual thing you can do is offer yourself to him. Amen? Amen? A grateful heart is a generous heart. And a generous heart is a grateful heart. And so what I want us to do this morning as we close is just to offer ourselves to him again.